<laughs> well, welcome to the Vintage Computer Festival Southwest. Um, I am Rebecca Ann Heinemann. I have been in the computer industry since the time that most of the computers on display have been created. Um, in fact, I'm probably older than they are. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about how in the world did I reverse engineer, reverse engineer the Atari 2600. And my motivation was I was penniless. <laughs> <laughs> Let's begin. Many, 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 many moons ago, I was this poor kid who liked computers, liked video games, and was introduced first to the Atari 80 that they somehow brought like a prototype at my high school, of all places. Um, that's when I started playing around with computers, so I knew I had the bug. Visited some friends of mine who had these computers with 6502 processors called the AIM-65 and the Commodore PET. And I would always be going to their houses every now and then to go ahead and check out what they got. Um, but Due to other circumstances, I ended up winning the Satari 2600 video game competition, which is definitely another tale. And that's well documented on YouTube, so I'm not going to rehash that. But when I got the Atari 2600 back in 1978, um, I wanted to get all the cartridges. I mean, who didn't want to get a nice big collection of cartridges because they had this magical machine that sat along your Fairchild Channel F and had far better graphics. <laughs> and yes, I had a Fairchild Channel F. I, I lost so many hours playing whiz ball on that thing. But the Atari 2600 with combat, pong, and breakout that actually looked like breakout in the arcades. Incredible. Um, but I didn't really have that much money, and scraping in 150 bucks or something to buy a Atari 2600 was a challenge. So, a friend of mine who, I will never understand this to the day I die, liked playing video games against me. And most notably, there was a game called Slot Racers. We first started with combat, but when Slot Racers came out, it was the game that he must have been a masochist. It's just the only reason I could possibly fathom as to why I would play against him and I would wipe the floor with him. Absolutely wipe the floor with him. So he would be buying these cartridges to try all these other games and I would play the game against him and I would wipe the floor with him. But it always goes back to slot racers. But I saw that he had this big stack of boxes of Atari 2600 games. And I'm like, well, I only have combat. <laughs> because <laughs> um, it came with it. <laughs> well, I also had the computer bug, and I also really would like to get one of those Apple II computers, those newfangled machines that just came out, and with a price tag of around $1,000, that was well, well beyond my price range. Undaunted, got a job at JCPenney at the gas station, which then later got a job at their warehouse. Definitely years I want to forget. But I was earning some income, and under the ever-present um, fear that it would be found out because I was like 16, and I didn't have parental permission to have a job, um, so I was 18 for at least three, maybe four years. <laughs> I saved up about $600, $700, give or take, still working that little thermometer of $1,000 you know, never understanding the concept of sales tax, but once I got the $1,000, I was gonna get my Apple II. But then there was this magazine called The Penny Saver. You know, back in a time before things like Craigslist wiped out all print publications for advertising. Um, Penny Saver, somebody was selling, and I'm not kidding, this is real, an Apple II for $600. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Call up the guy, he says, yep, Got an Apple II right here. So I got on my bicycle and totally not understanding the, that LA is a freaking huge city, <laughs> ended up having to ride my bike from Whittier, California to Los Angeles airport because he lived just south of the airport. That was about a two and a half hour bicycle ride. Now granted, I was in great shape back then, not this pear shape I am now, um, but managed to do the ride. Got there and I asked him, you know, like, and he goes like, 
We, our company, like Rockwell or something like that, bought a whole bunch of Apple IIs. They bought too many. He needed to just get rid of them. At least that's the story he gave me. I'm... <laughs> I didn't care. This big cardboard box with this shiny computer with 16 glorious K of memory. I mean, what am I going to do with all that memory? Got it on my bike. And for the next four and a half, six hours, it was the most grueling taking a bike on a 10 speed with a giant Apple II box about 20 miles. Even to this day, I don't even know how I did it, but I did it. <laughs> it's one of those like, my precious, this is my precious. I will never let this go. Pretty much like how most of you are right now with your VIC-20s and your Commodore 64s. <laughs> it's amazing what you can find at um, Goodwill. Just, and for great prices, too. Um, so, promptly I then discovered the world of wares, where you would meet up with other friends, meet together at their house, exchange pizzas and cassette tapes. <laughs> to which I then gleefully would go home, put the cassette in my player, play it, play Space Invaders or you know some other games on my Apple II, and start collecting those wares. And of course now, my new goal, my new thermometer, was for this new fangled thing called a disk drive. Ooh, I can actually put my files on these flat pancakes. <laughs> Incredible. So once again, saved all my money, got myself that floppy drive, plugged it in and started copying all my cassettes over to floppies. But then, as I was going to my friend's house, I was like, hmm, this is a computer and this is a cartridge which has a ROM on it. Since I have my Apple II, I know what the heck a ROM is. So... Hmm, how to read this? Well then, my next purchase, a modem. Hayes Micromodem, the little external device with 110 glorious baud. Because, you know, thing 1200 was kind of like that you know, really expensive, you know, Ferrari style modems. But 300 baud, 110 baud, where basically you're typing faster than you're actually transmitting, awesome. <laughs> Which then discovered the world of BBSs. Ooh, knowledge, the internet. And what's this thing called porn? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I think I'll forget that part. But the text files, that was my porn. Reading how to launch a nuclear missile, how a nuclear bomb actually works, how to make sarin with normal household chemicals. The, the things you learn from these BBSs, incredible. But one of the other things that they had on there was, hey, did you know that the pin of the Atari 2600 is this? Ooh, those are the address lines. Those are the data lines. Hmm. So, grabbing some parts at a place called Radio Shack, which at this time actually had parts, resistors, capacitors, connectors, and they actually had the 26 pin connector, I don't remember the exact number, but the, the connector for the Atari 2600, they had one that's compatible. Incredible. Maybe it was fate. Maybe it was destiny. I don't know. Maybe it was the fact that they just wanted my money and they said, <laughs> give me a vein. I got the parts for you. So with this knowledge, I could take the schematics from the Apple Red Book of the Apple II integer card. And with that, if I added a read-write line to it, I can then substitute the ROMs with 6116 static memory. And the fact that I'm remembering this crap, it means it is completely seared into my brain like a brand. So, Radio Shack is your friend. This is the actual card I built. It is literally based off of the um, Apple II integer car schematics with just a few modifications so that I would have a bank where I could turn on and off the reading and writing of memory. So at first, the first prototype was just an integer card that allowed me to read and write memory. But then I added 74 LS2545, which are uh, bidirec sorry, bidirectional latches, and a cable that goes to an EEPROM to that combat cartridge with a couple little modifications. And amazing, 
I could actually take the combat card I downloaded, upload the data into this thing, and I was playing combat. Incredible. So then I went and called up my friend, Mr. Slot Racer Death uh, Machine. You know those cartridges that Superman cartridges got? That Space Invaders card you got? Kind of borrowed for just a day. That's all I need. That other card you got, next day, like a library. Yeah, checking this out, checking this in, checking this out, checking this in. Until eventually I had every one of those cartridges <laughs> imaged and I had a floppy disk with every single game that I knew of at the time for the Apple II. And of course, it's amazing how much cred you get when you go to your local BBS pirate site and say, hey, look what I got. <laughs> <laughs> so, using this little doohickey, I was in for quite a while, just perfectly content, ripping off everybody's Atari 2600 cartridge that I could use in order to duplicate them and play them using an Apple II to hold the software and an actual Atari 2600 to play the game. Now we're going to go to a sidebar in history. The original Apple II was originally designed to work with a 6809 processor. But because Cinertech came in with a 6502 for 25 glorious dollars, Wozniak said, screw that, $100 CPU versus a $25 CPU, $75 of extra profit, I'm in. Especially when Steve Jobs is going like, I smell profit. I smell you know, turtlenecks and jeans in my future. <laughs> So with that, the Apple II became, or actually Apple I, to be more specific, the Apple I, became a 6502 computer, which then, the Apple II was a 6502 computer, which coincidentally, the Atari 2600 was a 6502 computer. Now that is where the key is. It's one of those where, had the decision of 6009 been there, we would be in an alternate reality, because definitely, <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'd be doing, but it definitely wouldn't be the path I went down. One day, I took a game like Combat, loaded it in the ROM, and I wanted to upload it. But for some reason, after I loaded it in memory, I decided to type in 800L to list the program. It was understandable. It was actual 6502 code, and I already knew enough 6502 to be dangerous. I'm definitely not an expert, but dangerous enough. And I was looking at this code going like, huh, how does this work? What does this do? Ooh, shiny red buttons. Let's see if it says load A with blah, push that register. Change that value, upload it to the cartridge. Hmm, crashes immediately. Okay, obviously bad idea. Change this one. Wait a minute, all the frogs in um, Freeway are now blue. So this register must be changing the sprite color. I'll make a note of that. This register changes the background color. I'll make a note of that. And over time, I disassembled like five or six different app, uh, uh, 2600 games. One of them I know is up on the internet, uh, Freeway. Um, if you go type in freeway.asm in Google, it'll take you to a reverse engineered version of the source code Freeway. That was me. <laughs> Um, but that was to learn how the Atari 2600 worked. So through it, I was able to figure out that, oh, this register does this, the background plane, this is what the missiles are, this is what this is. is. And, you know, and of course, my, there were gaps in my knowledge because it was all reverse engineered of the features that were used in the cartridge I was disassembling. If the cartridge didn't use a specific feature of the 2600, I had no knowledge of what that was. And then I won this Atari 2600 Space Invaders tournament. Yay me. So then I started writing articles on how to beat video games, worked on two books for video making video games. But nevertheless, I was still reverse engineering more of the 2600, learning about how the, um, all the registers worked, and figuring out that, oh, this first, this first 64 bytes is the actual register set. The next 64 bytes is the same. The next 128 bytes is the memory. And then the, at memory location 100 where the stack is, it's the same 128 bytes. Because, you know, little old me saying, hey, I'm gonna store something at memory location FF or FE, thinking that, hey, nobody else seems to be using it. And then the game kind of crashes and I realize, oh wait, every time I write to the stack, push, you know, call the subroutine, it destroys my, uh, data. So again, 
once at a time, piece by piece, I started mapping out everything in the Atari 2600, learning that memory location 2 hex 80, 280 is where the riot chip is. And of course, thankfully, there was a 6522, which you could go to another BBS, which says type in 6522 VIA. Here's the schematics. Here's all the registers. Wait, they map exactly on Atari 2600. Brilliance. So then, I started then making my own games. I, there was a game called Crossfire and Targ. Uh, they were basically the same game. Targ was in the arcades. I think it was like 1981 or something like that from Sega. And I said, this game looks pretty easy to do on the 2600. So using all this knowledge of how to do the backgrounds, if I made the backgrounds, I made some sprites on it, make it move it around. And it was just more of a proof of concept. It really wasn't a game because, you know, Again, gaps in my knowledge, but it was enough to make demos and know what's going on in the 2600. Well then, had this fortunate call with um, Arnie Katz at the Electronic Games Magazine. Now, when I mentioned earlier, when I won the tournament, I was writing articles for, the electron for how to beat video games. It was for Arnie Katz at Electronic Games Magazine. So as I was writing these articles about how to beat the video games, Arnie was, of course, talking to all the video game companies out there. Now, in 1981 and 82, Activision came onto the scene. And they went ahead and you know, proved that you could be a third party and release cartridges on the Atari 2600 and get sued. <laughs> but then, six, seven months later, the court said, nah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that led the, that began the stage in order for the video game crash of 83. Because once the floodgates were over, or, or were open, I kid you not, everybody and their cousin made a video game company. Of course, they had the established ones, iMagic, Activision, um, and then Mattel with M Network. Quaker Oats? <laughs> U.S. Games is owned by Quaker Oats. Seriously. Comavid was a little video game company run by just a couple of people um, themselves. Then you had 20th Century Fox. Then you had um, Parker Brothers. And so and there were just so many companies. Well, the problem is that there was another company, the Avalon Hill Game Company. They were already doing games for the Atari 800, the Commodore 64, but mostly they were really into board games, but they wanted a piece of the Atari 2600 pie. They were like, everybody's making money but me. Where is my bulldozer of money coming into my front door? I want, it. I want that uh, truck. So they went to Arnie Katz says, do you know many Atari 2600 programmers? The very next day, Arnie and I were on the phone talking about what my next article is going to be about. He says, oh yeah, and I made this cartridge. It's like, oh, you, how'd you make it? You know, plastic, clay, whatever. No, my Apple II, <laughs> blah, 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 and I reverse engineered it. It's like, so you could program the 2600? Yes. Show me. So I made a cart, burned the ROM, mailed it to him. A few days later, I get this phone call from Eric Dot of Avalon Hill Game Company saying, we just saw this demo. Would you like a job? <laughs> hmm. Pumping gas or working in a warehouse or doing something that I would probably do for free. And get the freaking expletive Phil rant away from my family. Another story. We won't go there. Yes, please. So, the very next day, I get a FedEx, or whatever it was, the express mail back then, with plane ticket, itinerary, and everything I need. So I got a steamer trunk, put everything I owned in it. Trust me, it was fun figuring out how to shove an Apple II in there. <laughs> but I did. And I then took the steamer trunk, my sorry butt, and flew one way to Towson, Maryland, a city just outside of Baltimore, to where they said, so you could program the Atari 2600? And I'm like, sure, yeah, why not? 
says, all right, get to work. Here's a computer and everything. It's like, okay. So I started putting together, you know, a demo stuff for the Atari 2600, but then he came and said, so what dev kit do you use? This, this, and then I said, <laughs> and they're like, you're the real thing. <laughs> you really did reverse engineer the thing. So can you make more of these? Where's the, late, where's the Radio Shack? And uh, that was a fun day, going to Radio Shack with a basket filled with Apple II carts, which they actually did sell, these Apple II empty boards at Radio Shack at the time. But little breadboards here, the, all the sockets and everything, and of course, several, about a dozen spools of wire wrap wire. And for the next month, I was building dev kits because they were bringing in about five or six other programmers to work on the Atari 2600. So at this point, I started teaching them, saying, this register does this, this register does this, and then others were kind of like, oh wait, what does this register, oh, we figured this out. So we all worked together to fill in all the blanks. So within another six more months, we had the entire Atari 2600 laid out. You know, no, no exceptions. We, we knew everything that chip did. Um, but, I got tired of wire wrapping, so I learned how to etch circuit boards. <laughs> and yeah, this is hand laid out by hand, in which I had to take this, like a special, there's a special tool which you use to, to mark down the wires and stuff like that, um, but made the etching boards for these things. And this is what I call the Sluggo One. Because at the time, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and they had Mr. Bill and Sluggo. It says, okay, well, since I'm going to be mean to the Atari 2600, why not call it Sluggo? And this was one of the original Sluggo 1 boards for the Atari 2600 that we use at Avalon Hill. And I pressed something like about 20 of these, and then I soldered it in. And of course, this is the original prototype. The others didn't have any of these because... <laughs> Being my first circuit board, I missed a few spots. <laughs> but as you can see, the same idea. Just 6116 RAM, same kind of parts, because if you look in here, it's the same parts. It's basically the same board. It's just done as a circuit board instead of, and because I didn't, I rarely ran my Apple II with a lid. That's why it's a bit taller, because I don't need, I said, I don't give a crap. I just went ahead and made the board taller, whereas this one actually fits in an Apple II with the lid closed, this one doesn't. <laughs> so using this, we mass produced this, 20 of them, if you can call that mass production. With that, we then at Avalon Hill created five video games. Um, London Blitz, Out of Control, Death Trap, Wall Ball, and Space Shuttle. Um, out of Control and um, London Blitz are the ones I worked on. Um, the others I did some programming on, but really the other programmers should take the credit for those games. But with that, I knew how to do dev kits. <laughs> so of course, when the inevitable occurred and five kajillion video game companies making 20 zillion video games flooded the market, the entire market imploded. So then in 1982, or late 82, when I saw the signs of this, I left Avalon Hill, went to work at a place called uh, eight Time Warner HBO. It was just called HBO at the time. Um, and we were working on a new machine called the Play Cable System. Um, fortunately, no prototypes of it exist, at least if any do, I certainly do not have them. But it was basically an, a, a cartridge in which we put a Z80 on it, 64K of memory, and the hardware necessary for it to be a cable TV box. The idea behind this was that it was going to be your cable TV box, and you were able to download games into it, because, you know, I just repurposed this, <laughs> and uh, it played cartridges. Of course, I added a little extra hardware to the bank switching because, you know, back in 1983, bank switching was a new thing. And um, so I included that hardware in there. And I even had a prototype of just a, um, like a video display so you can type in words. So it'd be like, you know, typing in basic. 
and I had a prototype of Tempest because the game, the system allowed you to do bitmap graphics because it used the Atari 2600 only as a display. The game was actually run on the Z80. So I would run it in Z80, Z80's memory, have mapped some of that memory to the Atari. The Atari just read it in, write it out, and that's all it did. And it displayed a Tempest vector beam. And that was just a proof of concept to say, why in the world would you want this set-top box instead of just cartridges? And because, you know, this whole thing was going to be retailing for like between 99 to 149, um, you know, that's his retail price. But unfortunately, the people at HBO kind of saw the writing on the wall that I did, which was the market was going to implode. So they canceled the project after like four months and I ended up being unemployed. Moved back to California, went to work for a company called Boom Corporation, where we were doing VIC-20 games. VIC-20 games, ROMs. <laughs> 6502. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> well, with the 6502 and the fact it was a ROM, I then found an old VIC-20 cartridges and sacrificed it to the great VIC-20 gods and plugged this cable into it. That's when I went ahead and put together what I call lovingly Sluggo 2. Basically, it's an Apple II board like this. It was wire wrap, only one was made. And it was essentially designed to have 64K of memory on it with bank switching to do VIC-20 games. But then this new fangled machine was coming out called the um, Super NES. The Super NES had a challenge. It had two ROMs in it, not one, two. So this thing, either I'd have to use two of these Sluggos or Sluggo 3. Now I didn't bring one with me, but Sluggo 3 had an interesting feature. The cable that came out, two of them for the two ROMs, plugs into personality modules. What this personality module is? Basically, it's the Sacrifice Atari 2600 cartridge. In this case, I designed, this one is for the, the um, let me see, is this, yeah, this is for the Super Nintendo. What this board does is I plugged in the cable in here, and I plug this into the Super Nintendo, and the Sluggo was a 512K static memory ROM emulator. But I had a cartridge for the Tari, for the C64, the VIC-20, the Sega Genesis, same dev kit. I just had to change out the module. It was so, when I was at Interplay, they were like, what the hell is this thing you've got? And they didn't even know where I made it. So I made this thing. I wired it up and built it. Um, can we buy some from you? So here it is. I'm working at Interplay. I'm actually one of the owners of Interplay. And they were buying Sluggo 3s from me. I even sold Sluggo 3s to Silicon and Synapsis, who you may know them know, now them know today as Blizzard. Yeah. Mm. They were using my dev kit, my uh, ROM emulator, for creating Lost Vikings and so forth. This personality cartridge I'm holding in my hand, which is, was donated to the Video Game History Museum. This is the one I actually developed uh, Wolfenstein 3D for the Super Nintendo Out of This World. So this is the actual dev kit. <laughs> so um, basically I've gone through most of the stuff I was going to be talking about a little early here, but if anybody has any questions here, because I'm certain you probably do, who wants to go first? <laughs> you put your hand up. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Like yeah. Anybody have a question? I have a question, but i got to walk over to the mic, I think. All right. Go over to the mic, mic. And if your name is Mike, it'll be really recursive. It's my son. Ah, there you go. Great. So, so, can you hear me? Mr. AB guy? We'll, we'll assume so. So, thanks for the talk. Excellent. Very sure. Nice thank you. As a Atari 2600 aficionado, I imagine you have an opinion about this. Uh, E.T., <laughs> Worst game ever, or does it get a bad rap? It's bad. I wouldn't say it's the worst game ever, but it's pretty, it's in the top ten. I, I mean, if you saw some of the shovelware from Swedish Erotica, um, or from U.S. Games, uh, it may take the... the the title, but E.T. was one of those where if you spend $10 million on a license, you may want to spend a percentage of that on actual programming a game based on it. 
but there's my opinion. <laughs> Next victim? Yes. Um, you worked at Interplay? Yes, I worked at Interplay. I was one of its founders, one of several. <laughs> Any other questions? Or is that it? Yeah, at Interplay I did like pretty much every, from the first five years of Interplay's conception, I either wrote the game or I did a majority of work on it. Um, after five years then, we had enough people that I didn't have to be the sole person, or almost sole person, making money. I mean, Jay and Troy were doing, uh, what was it, uh, World Book Encyclopedia games, and then later on they did a Laserdisc thing for the military. I'm not kidding. That's what we, we, we were young. We needed the work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but Atari 2600 just basically, you know, knowing how NTSC works and really helped uh, figuring out how 2600 worked, but it was really just, what does that button do? <laughs> yes? So, um, a question I've always posed to myself, I had a similar situation yeah. with tinkering with big 20 cartridges and things like that, and I always ask myself, if you had been your age then, now, with technology the way it is, do you think you would have still done tinkering with the way things are today, or do you feel like it would have been virtually impossible with the way well, things the, are set up? As the question is, is that if I was 14 years old today, instead of back in 1978, 77 back then, where, you know, Radio Shack <laughs> sold wire wrap, you know, wire wrap sockets and 74 Ellis does 245s, um, Today, what I would probably be is I would probably be somebody using an Arduino or Raspberry Pi in which I'm not actually designing the circuits themselves, but I'm just doing all the software on it and then using the pins to do the horrible things. I know I've been approached by friends who want to basically make Sluggo 4. And of course, Sluggo 4, I would use kind of like more of a, um, an ARM-based system on a chip with a, with, I think it's the chips, there's a one megabyte times eight bit static RAM. And it's what they're using these days for those, um, those cartridges that have all the games in them and so forth. They use something like that. And then I would essentially use that and we connected to your PC with a USB port instead of uh, the Sluggo 3 used a parallel port. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be doing low-level circuitry like this, I would probably be learning FPGAs, um, learning the, the Verilog language and things like that. I've learned some of it right now, but definitely not enough to consider myself an expert. It's one where that if I was to do a hardware project, I'd probably team up with somebody who actually speaks Verilog, and I would say, this is what we need on the software side, and they do the hardware side, and then marriage made in heaven. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Could you still use those boards today to make like modern games? That'd be fun, right? What'd you say again? Okay, could you make like modern games? Or have you thought of making any new Atari or new Big 20 games like today? Um, if I was retired, yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, that is, my, that is my life goal, is that um, after I decide to say, you know what, I'm not going to be making any more console games, I'm not going to be making any more, um, you know, not doing stuff that requires me to earn a paycheck. Um, one of my goals is basically to start using a YouTube channel where I'd be just coding daily or something like that, and I would be making a new Atari 2600 game. Um, I'd probably also do a, um, a no 3DO game, just because, uh, for the lulls. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kickstarter, people will give you money for games like that. Yeah, but then that commits me to it, and when I have, let's say, uh, like right now I have a publisher who's breathing down my neck in which I have to deliver a game by the end of this month, um, I need to commit to that first before I commit to something else. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yes? Um, did you ever blow anything up or did anything go spectacularly wrong while you were tinkering? That's an excellent question because the answer is yes. <laughs> the question is, did I suffer catastrophic failures? And yes, I think I must have, uh, in the later years, there were several um, Nintendo 8-bits and Atari 2600s which went up in smoke, literally, because I, the power line, because like when I was soldering things together, I would accidentally solder a power line directly to one of the data lines, and you'd be amazed how much C uh, chips do not like that. <laughs> 
Um, I remember one time I did that to this cable and I plugged it in, turned it on, and then the cable caught fire. And so of course I turned it off and I had to put out the fire. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> because look at this. This is wire wrapping. Do you know how easy it is to get a short doing this thing? <laughs> Um, it's been one of my main reasons because once I started working at Avalon Hill, working on these Sluggo Ones, um, I think I spent at least four or five hours a week doing nothing but fixing other people's dev kits. They would start up saying, hey, I can't work it. So, okay, great. Okay, this thing doesn't work. Where do you start? <laughs> and then I would find the connection. Oh, here's two wires that are touching. Fix that, clip that, okay, you're working. And that's most of the time, but finding that wire is the, uh, the challenge. But this is the kind of stuff that we used in 1981 through 1983 to develop Atari 2600 cartridges. And from what I understand from other people in the industry, I was not alone doing it this way. Because, <laughs> you know, Atari 2600 dev kits, Atari would laugh in your face if you asked for one. And so you had to come up with ways of doing it yourself. <laughs> so you just brought that up. Are you aware of some of the other techniques people used? Yes. Um, back in the day, um, there were four different ways that I knew of that people used to, to develop Atari 2600 titles on their own. Number one, they just ripped off how Atari did it. Activision example. They bought themselves a PDP-8. They bought the same ROM emulation hardware from the same vendors, from the same, and then because they remembered how it worked, they just wrote their own software, which did pretty much the same thing Atari did. So they just made their own Atari dev kits on their own. Number two, there was a company called, um, Snasm or something like that. Not, not Snasm, but there's a predecessor to them. They had a 6502 in-circuit emulator. What this did is that you desoldered your 6507 from your Atari 2600. You plug this thing into it. Then what it would do is that you would put RAM inside of this um, in-circuit emulator, and then that's where you'd be putting in your software. But one of the biggest advantages this thing did was that because it was actually replacing the 6502, they were able to read and write registers directly, so it made it a lot faster for them to reverse enter 2600 and than anyone else. Now, I actually was able to acquire one of these from Parker Brothers. Now, that device and all the software thing, I already donated it to the Atari, to the Video Game History Museum. So if you just ask the curators, they'll be able to show it to you. But it's a, uh, runs to a, I think it was a parallel port on a PC, and then it just had a cross assembler, put it in this device, then it had a piece of software when it ran, then the 6502 would start to run, and then you'd just be tracing everything, figuring out your debugging. It was like, for me, it was like a gift from the gods to be able to debug that way on the Atari 2600. But this is what Parker Brothers did. The next group was the ones who made their own ROM emulators as well. There was a uh, off-the-shelf ROM emulator that was available from, I think, Jamdac, Jamdec or something like that. Um, and it was like, you know, 8K, 4K. And they just simply bought those. It was connected to a serial port. And then that plugged into a sacrificed combat cartridge. And that's how they did development. And that was most of the other companies, like US Games and so forth. They did it that way. And then, of course, the Apple II which Mattel, um, the Kitchens, um, Steve and Dan, uh, Dan Kitchen and so forth, the, uh, the Kitchen Brothers, um, the, the so forth, we all use Apple IIs and the equivalent of this thing to do all of our games. So like when you play several of the Activision games done by the Kitchens, they were done with this or something like this on an Apple II. <laughs> And those are essentially the methodologies that the companies use at the time. So either you spend a lot of money buying off-the-shelf components, or in one case, a PDP-8 mainframe computer, or you use an Apple II with a, either Big Mac or the later on Merlin assembler, wrote your games on an Apple II, and just pushed it up onto the device. <laughs> yes, now yeah. you have a question. I do now. You mentioned being 
into the early days of BBS yes. through Bod Modem, early low Bod Modem. Mm -hmm. And other than being slow, treacherous, and dubi of dubious legality in some areas, what was the general experience like using BBS's Logging into B tell, phoning into BBSs on Apple II or similar PCs. Well, for me, I was leaked. Uh, because, you know, when you have a disk full of every Atari cartridge ever made, you'd be amazed how many BBSs will give you leaked status. Yeah. So then I was able to download all the floppy disks and cracked wares and be able to then, you know, say, ooh, look at the latest games on the Apple II. I could go and play them here. Uh, uh, they're already pre-cracked. Um, but the... Um, the Necronomicon is the way I refer to it. It's the book of forbidden knowledge. The text files with the, you know, when I was talking about nuclear codes and how to build a nuclear bomb, I wasn't kidding. I actually know how to build a nuclear bomb. <laughs> um, on, you know, tritium, deridium, how to do the reflectors, uh, phrases that basically, were, you know, back then would have required clearance. <laughs> um, today, it's like you can Google it. Um, but the... Oh, there was text files for all that stuff, plus you know text file versions of the Anarchist Cookbook, um, all sorts of just knowledge. That, and of course, for me, the one I was doing was the one I was in Taos in Maryland because essentially the statute of limitations has run out. Um, I was doing a lot of phone freaking. Um, it was amazing how many people you can erase their phone bills on, and you know, including your own, so that you don't uh, let you know don't have to pay a phone bill. And of course, to stay innocent. I didn't erase my phone bill every month. But I found like six people, I just picked at random, every month I erased their phone bills. So if they ever, you know, tried to track it down, <laughs> they'd go after them. <laughs> Including one of the persons that I didn't like because he ran a BBS I hated and he wouldn't give me elite status. <laughs> Which goes to another anecdote there if you really wanted about BBSing. There was a BBS in Towson, Maryland who wouldn't give me elite status. So, I decided, you're going down. <laughs> so, logged into the BBS. It was not low level, but I remembered, this is AppleSoft Basic. Now, those of you who know about AppleSoft Basic also knows that there's a thing called the input bug. You type in 99E99, hit return. That causes the floating point software to overflow and break the program. If you do not have a break interceptor installed in your BBS, it would break you to the AppleSoft prompt. And because the way BBSs worked, because they were tracking the input and output, it put me at a basic prompt. So it's like, I now have super user access. <laughs> so I then directory, you know, type in, you know, cat, look at the directory, good. Cat uh, drive two, okay, so he's on a floppy disk. He's got two volumes. Hmm, what to do with this newfound power? I know assembly. The directory is on track 11, or was it track 13? I don't remember now, it's one of those tracks. So, don't touch that track. Write a little piece of software, blank out a buffer, and have the software track zero. For sector zero to 16, write the zero sector. Track one, track two, track three. Oh, skip the directory track, all the other tracks. Go to the other drive, do the same thing. Okay, PR number six, which is reboot. Bye. <laughs> I heard later on from the grapevine, the guy was like, what the hell, I don't know what happened to my BBS. It's just, all of a sudden, it just, the files are there, but it won't boot. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> okay. But that's what happens when you know assembly language. <laughs> So learn assembly language, okay? Come on. I mean, C is good, but there's something about assembly language. It's like it gives you the power of God. <laughs> Next victim, anybody else? Yes. Um, what's your favorite game category for your Oh, there's two. Uh, Bard's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate, and Dragon Wars. Those are the games that I will always just be so proud of being the ones who created them. I and I created both of those games. So nobody else could say, hey, I created, worked on, you know, the, those couple people who helped me work on it, like uh, laying out maps and storylines, but the game engine, the stuff, that was me. And both of those games are games even to this day I'm very, very proud of playing. And in fact, look, sometimes I fire them up and play them. Any other questions? 
because now we're, oh, yes, you. Uh, what was your experience in the early days where publishers were reluctantly trying to give credits to developers? That's an excellent question. Question is, what was it like during the time that publishers didn't publish your name in games? <laughs> That's where I had the burger word come from. Early on, I knew that companies would take credit for the titles I worked on. In fact, it was an open secret because when Activision first formed, their main problem was that they were making these games for Atari, yet nobody knew who they were. And so when they made Activision, they published the names of the developers. Of course, most game companies even then was like, no, 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 it's being made by Parker Brothers. It's made by, you know, Morton Salt, I don't care. Um, so, when I started doing games both for Boone Corporation and in Interplay, I needed a way to sign my work. When I was at Boone, uh, there was a stunt done on me in which my computer booted up and it had this picture of me getting my head chopped off by Mike Boone, who was our CEO. And we named the picture Management Type. Okay, ha ha, funny, put the file away. But then I used that file as a piece of art in a majority of the games I wrote from 1982 to 1986, 87, in which either you boot up like Mind Shadow or Tracer Sanction or Borrow Time, and you either press the B key on Startup or you type in the word burger or something like that, that picture would show up. <laughs> Later on, when I didn't have room on the disc for such a picture, I put something in the game, such as like, in, again, in Mind Shadow or Task Times in Tone Town, if you type in the word burger anywhere in the game, it would say, you hear some rustling in the next room, and a crazed manager type comes running in and lops your head off. Game, game over. <laughs> or in Bard's Tale, you'd go into the Temple of the Mad God, and it goes like, you have entered the Temple of the Mad God, Mad God. what shall thou say? And the correct answer is Tarjan. But what if you say, burger? <laughs> they would go, oh, blasphemy! You've uttered the most unholy word, prepare to die! And then I would just hit you with like 90, uh, four groups of 99 of the worst monsters in the whole game. And unless you were like the top, top level of experience, you were paced. <laughs> so of course, people would say, well, you didn't work on Bard's Tale. Oh, I didn't, huh? <laughs> Type in burger when you're in the temple. And tell me, why is that there? And it does help because I've had people try to take credit for games I've worked on or try to claim I didn't work on those games. And then I would say, well, then why is this in there? And then they shut up. <laughs> of course, nowadays, today, credits are now pretty much a requirement in video games. Although, you know, I'm working with a client right now who for some reason I've been asking them for their credits, for, you know, for their people's contribution they haven't given to me. It's like, okay, I'm gonna run the game without your credits, so it'll just be us. Your loss. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at least today, I don't have to put my, you know, I don't have to put burger in there. I might do it just for fun, um, but it's not like as bad as it was back in the 80s and 90s. But that was a great question. <laughs> Any other questions left? Because we only have like uh, five or six minutes before I'm given the hook. <laughs> okay, you first. And then... Huh? Oh, no, I'll just repeat your question. So, um, so you said you didn't like ET. Is there specific reasons why and how would you improve it if you did? Um, I've never given one iota of thought of how I would improve ET. I didn't like the game because I would fall into a hole and I have no idea how to get out. Um, because, sadly, back in 1980, as it is here today in 2023, no one reads the instructions. We spend all these hours, many, many hours, putting art, text, stuff in these instruction manuals, and no one even bothers to open it. I've seen so many copies of instruction manuals on dealer shelves in which they look like they were just printed. But I didn't read the manual. So I didn't know how to get out there. I just simply, like most games, you start to play the game and figure you'd intuit it. I did not ever expect to have a game that would require me to read the manual in order for me to get out of a freaking hole. And therein is the issue, is that I would have just simply redesigned the game in such a way that no matter what happens to you, you wouldn't need to read the manual. It would be obvious. Um, that said, 
I would have to sit down and think, how would I make an Atari 2600 version of E.T.? I don't know if I'd do a better job, but I just know that I would at least make it so that you wouldn't fall in holes and have no clue how to get out. <laughs> All right, uh, yes, you. Yeah, I was just going to ask him um, what your favorite and least favorite pieces of hardware and game consoles were. Ooh. The question is, what is my favorite and least favorite hardware in the game consoles? Least favorite would probably have to be the, the Sega X32 and, yeah, 32X, and a runner-up would be the Jaguar, only because both of them had the promise of multiple processors to run the games really, really fast. But their hardware had so many bugs that you had to do all these workarounds and you're fighting, you're half fighting the hardware when you're trying to spend time to finish the game and get it done. Um, the ones I like the most for development of all things, as I'm going to say, is the Apple IIGS. I made so many games on things. I was just, I was literally, for a period of time, I was churning out games about one a month. Um, because it was so simple to program. I was already familiar with the Apple II, so I'd already had like 10 years of experience of 6502 at the time the 2GS came around. So moving to 6816 was a no-brainer. Um, and the operating system and so forth was just, to me, the perfect machine. It, I really was heartbroken when Apple decided to discontinue it, all because they just wanted to push a Mac down my throat. Of yes? Where can we find your 2GS games? Uh, probably now on uh, Internet Archive or something like that. I mean, it's not like they're available in stores. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what are they called? Oh, boy. Let's see here. Um, question. What is the list of my Apple II GS games? I will, be, I will be omitting several because I've been working on so many, it's not funny. Um, Bart's Tale 1 and 2, Ultima 1, Wolfenstein 3D, Out of This World, Task Times in Tone Town, Borrowed Time, Mind Shadow, um, Crystal Quest, uh, Battle Chess. Um, I know there's a couple more. Um, it, it's Sim City. Um, didn't get released though, um, but it was finished. Um, then there was uh, Wasteland, which also didn't get released. Uh, Bart's Tale 3, I only got partially done. I just didn't get the art done for it. Um, there was a couple more I did. Um, some side-scrolling game, I'm trying to remember. Oh, um, Rescue Rover, Catacombs Abyss, um, gosh, I know there's like two or three more other games I did, but it's just that, you know, those are games I did back in 1986 through 1992, so I, I, they're blurring. <laughs> Um, but that's, you know, I, I, do, I love just churning out all the technical problems. And once I solved all the technical problems on the 2GS, I was just churning out the games. Um, yes? So do you think there's unreleased games that you have or you did have that were never released ever somewhere? Yeah, I have all three of them. I, I have the source code of Wasteland, um, Bard's Tale 3 for the 2GS, and uh, SimCity. I still have them on my hard drive. I, in fact, I've been sending notes to EA saying, begging them to let me release them um, because uh, Wasteland technically is now owned by Microsoft, so I don't have to talk to them about that. Um, and same with Bart's Tale 3. Uh, but uh, SimCity is definitely um, EA. And I, I think I contacted them like, like six, six or seven weeks ago, and I got the usual. No, we were looking into it. Yes, we released a source code to SimCity for the Mac, but we don't know about what we're going to do with the 2GF. <laughs> but it, it's just like, I'm just waiting for the day, one day, when somebody who may be watching this video right now, that if you work at EA <laughs> Licensing, do me a favor and just give me an email or something that says, if I release uh, SimCity for the 2GS, that I will not get sued. <laughs> so, yes. Did you have a set of libraries that you brought, that you used in one game and then brought forward to the next game and brought forward to the next game? That's an excellent question. And the answer is a big emphatic yes. Um, what I had done is that very early on, when I was doing the Apple II, C64, and Atari 800 games, because the Atari 800 I did Mind Shadow and Racing Destruction Set, um, 
I had found that there were certain libraries like called drawing a text function, drawing a line, setting up the video display. They're all the same. So all the code does is they set the screen, start this, and draw a line or something like that. So the main code didn't care. It just wanted to do this. So I created what I called Burgerlib. Burgerlib 1 was all done in 6502 assembly, and I had a version for Apple II, Commodore, and Atari 800. And all I did was I wrote the main game to the library, and I swapped the library for the different ones. In fact, this is a fun fact, true thing. Task Times and Tone Town on the Commodore 64 is used as ProDOS. Apple II ProDOS. <laughs> Now you may ask yourself, what? <laughs> what I did was that I wrote the game all in the Apple II, and of course I had the Apple II file system and so forth, writing it there and using the ProDOS operating system. But I built this card that plugs in the Apple II that was a serial card that goes directly to a 1541 drive, so the 1541 drive was being driven by the Apple II. So of course the Apple II didn't know it was the C64 disk, so it created a ProDOS volume and everything in there. So I just copied all the files in there, formatted it, you know, and it said, here it is, a Protoss, and it actually uses a Protoss volume. No problem. It, it, the Apple II and the 2GS thought it was another Apple drive. So I thought, I don't want to worry about dealing with this. So I wrote a little piece of software for the Commodore 64 that was a Protoss shell. And when, what you did to run Task Times in Tone Town is that you would see an app called Protoss.sys. You would just run that. Because even though it would say task.system, task, you know, all these file systems, and what the Protoss did is it loaded in, loaded in its loader and all the stuff, then it went to the directory, and just like Protoss, looked for the first system file, booted it up, and it thought it was running on an Apple II, except using Burgerlib C64, and there it goes, it runs, and the file system was using Protoss. If you look, if you ever get a disk image of Task Times and Tone Town Commodore, look at track zero. You will find on there a ProDOS directory of all the files right there. Whereas the Commodore 64 is only like two blocks I use for the catalog. One is the actual bitmap for the Commodore 64. The other one is the Commodore 64 file that says ProDOS followed by the actual ProDOS loader. That's all I use that track for. It's true. Oh, you want another one? Dragon Wars for the IBM, for the PC, my very first DOS game. Wrote it on Apple II to using a 2GS cross assembler that built, uh, 60, it built 8086 assembly on the Apple II. And I used a PC transporter to copy the files to an uh, IBM disk. And then that was what, how I mastered the disks and got Dragon Wars running on a PC. Don't believe me? dump the first 206 bytes of dragon.com and there will be a text string in there created on an Apple II GS, Apple II forever. <laughs> oh, I'm certain that you at the home audience are doing this right now and you're going to go in there and say, that bitch is a psycho. <laughs> <laughs> and so, since I've now run out of time, I will conclude it with that. Thank you.